Um, so, first of all, I would like to say uh, thank you very, very much for the award. Um, it's a great honor and pleasure to receive this award from Andesim. It's a web platform that we uh, hope all of us use on a daily basis. So, uh, it's really an honor <coughs> to receive this award from our peers and all of you. So, um, we're very, very grateful. COBE is an office situated in uh, Copenhagen. Uh, we are roughly 100 people. Uh, this is a picture of our office space. And uh, to give a sort of a, a little bit of a <clears throat> uh, an explanation of who we are, we're an interdisciplinary office and we work both in urbanism, public space and architecture. And that's because we have a belief that if we uh, know more about the public spaces surrounding our buildings, we're able to design better buildings. And likewise, if we are better at making uh, planning plans, then we are also able to make better public spaces and architecture in these plans. That these three elements, they're able to cross-fertilize each other. And our mission statement is to, uh, cr um, to create architecture which uh, generate unique opportunities for people, places, and communities. Um, and this means that it's not the architecture itself that's in focus, but the people are going to use it afterwards. Um, when we design, we like to focus on what we call uh, architecture as a collective impact. And uh, to do this, uh, I will exemplify by using an image of a well-known architect who sits at his desk alone and he designs and then he gives his sketches to uh, the junior architects and uh, they uh, then draw it up for him. This is not how we work. Um, we work together as teams, uh, and we like to uh, use Lego as, a, as an example of this. And uh, what we mean by um, Lego is that uh, when you work with Lego, you usually work together, you sit and build things together, like in this public project. Um, people sit and build blocks together, they collaborate, they interact, but not only with uh, amongst the architects, but also with uh, the clients, with the engineers, with the uh, inhabitants, uh, with the stakeholders, and so forth. And together, we believe that we can create these uh, unique and amazing structures that then are for people. Um, we have uh, three uh, key elements that we try to work with in all of our projects. One is, of course, public space, that we have a public element in all of our projects. Um, if it's a train station like Nørreport, uh, or in uh, the North Harbor in Copenhagen, or East Place. What we also want to do is we want to uh, um, make sure that all our projects have a human scale. That this means that the projects are scaled down to the eye of uh, the people uh, surrounding it. So uh, that the building is broken down into pieces and this is experienced smaller than it actually is. The last thing that we really try to do is that we work with context. We really have a strong belief that when we uh, read the context correctly, that we can generate unique projects. And this doesn't mean that we're historical architects. Uh, it means that actually the, the, the his history of a site can help uh, generate new contemporary architecture that is uh, not only uh, contemporary, but also innovative. Um, <clears throat> zooming out, uh, making a strong contrast uh, to what we heard before, uh, we are very much working in, uh, uh, in urbanism, and right now there is a huge urban migration uh, that we experience anyways in uh, Denmark, in Copenhagen, that people more and more are going towards the cities and actually are running away from rural areas. And uh, this is uh, creating new problems, like in these favelas in uh, Brazil, where you have these uh, rich and poor completely juxtaposed. You have these great divisions between rich and poor, you have congestion in the city, so infrastructure is being overloaded. And also, uh, uh, when the cities grow, so do the uh, pressure on the public systems. For example, exemplified in a Chinese school like this. Um, Kobe has been around now for uh, a little more than 11 years. And uh, as part of our uh, 10th anniversary, we tried to make a re retrospective, and this meant that we wanted to actually look a little bit backwards and sort of um, showcase what did we actually learn from working in Copenhagen. Uh, what sort of new tendencies have we seen uh, in Copenhagen? 
this uh, transition in the city. Uh, and for this, we, uh, we titled uh, both uh, a book and an exhibition, Our Urban Living Room. And we did this because uh, we felt that this title sort of describes how people use the contemporary city. And that is that uh, the city is now an extension of your living room. It's an extension of your house. It's how you choose to live, that you uh, use uh, many spaces in the city as, uh, as you would your own house. So uh, this is the book uh, that has been uh, published, uh, that we sent out. Uh, unfortunately, it's already sold out because we had a small uh, um, amount of books published, but there's uh, more coming out uh, this Christmas. But what we uh, wanted to say with this book is to sort of show how, um, for example, Copenhagen, uh, here you see uh, one of the walking streets today, uh, it uh, transformed itself from actually being a street in the center of the city to being a pedestrianized area for people. Um, or for example, uh, Islandsborg, which is one of the most uh, heavily used public spaces of the waterfront, which transformed from being actually an area that is completely filled with chemicals and uh, pollutants and uh, and <clears throat> warehouse in production, and now has become uh, actually a giant public swimming pool for all of the city. And it, in fact, it's uh, an image like this that we find sort of really characterizes this uh, um, title, Our Urban Living Room, where you see um, people in the background using uh, the harbor front, and this man who's made a, a raft with his uh, own little living room floating around the city. Um, so, to give a little bit of a, a, a background story of this, um, Copenhagen for many years has been described as the most livable city in the world uh, by Monopoly. It's also, we, for some reason, we've also been characterized as the happiest people in the world. Um, and, but uh, when you look at Copenhagen and other, and we try to compare ourselves with the great cities of the world, uh, you can see this diagram where you see, for example, the Eiffel Tower in Paris, or sort of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, Statue of Liberty, and so forth. And the only thing we have is uh, the Little Mermaid, <laughs> which, is, which is a little bit funny, uh, because uh, you always see these tourists who come to the city, and they experience this uh, very, very small statue, and this is actually our great monument of the city. But what Copenhagen has actually been trying to do is to rebrand itself um, on this idea of livability and how the city should be um, catered to the needs of the people. And they try to exemplify this uh, through this logo of the bicycle. Um, that people, they, uh, they use the bicycle as they would a car and they use it as a, a means of transportation, but also as a for example, here in a, in a, when the streets are opened in the city of Copenhagen. Uh, so what Copenhagen actually has been doing is it, it's been branding itself on this new infrastructure that actually shows this uh, high quality of living, this new infrastructure that is actually for people uh, so that they can live a, a simpler life in the city instead of uh, moving out to uh, the suburbs. Um, streetscapes can be uh, used uh, more actively for uh, pedestrians. This is, a, of course, a day where the streets are closed. But to, uh, to show this, um, uh, we, uh, we tried to uh, frame a few uh, titles in the book. One of them is From Infrastructure to Public Space. And it's this notion of uh, why do we actually, in the cities, spend more time on, uh, on creating infrastructure instead of making more public space for people. Um, and maybe the first, uh, the first project I would like to show is actually an uh, This is really the idealized image of how people use the bike. You know, it's a sunny day, uh, and you ride your bike, you drop off your kid at the, the crash and so forth. But unfortunately, this is maybe a, a few weeks a year in Denmark. The rest of the time, it's uh, raining, it's snowing, uh, and uh, this is still doesn't this still doesn't stop people from using their bicycles. This is their pri primary means of transportation. Um, <clears throat> this is a map of uh, Copenhagen, uh, and uh, these gray lines are actually showing the intensity of bicycle usage in the city. 
And uh, this red dot in the center is actually um, Nurport. And what you see here is actually that Nurport is at the epicenter of all infrastructure. It's the most congested point in the city. It's the most trafficated point in the city. More than a quarter of a million people, they pass through this point every day by bike, bus, uh, car, train, metro, and so forth. Um, these are the train lines that uh, pass through the city. Um, and this story st uh, starts with a, a train station, a airport, which is actually underneath the ground, uh, which was built, uh, I think, uh, more than 100 years ago, uh, before you uh, drilled the metro lines. This is when you dug them out, and then you, uh, put the, you encased them. This is a airport when it uh, opened. This is what the train station looked like. And actually on top, um, it was a very pleasant public space. You see some tram lines, lots of bicycles, plenty of space. Uh, but what happened over time, actually, is that uh, Nauport uh, turned into this traffic chaos. Uh, and what you see here in the center is the old station, and it's uh, where you access the, the trains. Um, and uh, it was basically surrounded by uh, roads. And it became this uh, chaos. Uh, so when people, they had to drop off the bike, they had to do it in this litter of bicycles. And uh, lit literally, it was difficult to find your bike. Um, and it was also dark, it was dirty, and it was uh, hard to find and get an overview there as a pedestrian, or find out where your train was leaving from. Um, this image is uh, uh, of the old train station, and it's, and it's actually quite profound for our approach to the project because it, uh, it shows really the movement patterns of the people in the snow. And here you can actually see the, the way that people use the, the public space. So when we started the competition, we, uh, we reimagined the, the space, completely cleaning it from uh, um, uh, roads. And actually, the only thing that we had to sort of um, make sure was that, uh, maybe it's a little bit difficult to see, but these small, access points, the stairs to the train station, we couldn't move these, we had to reuse them. And also, of course, the building blocks gave the framework for the city. Um, what we did then was try to map out the movement of the people and actually try to figure out how do people use the space and then to design the functions around it. So that actually you have this series of flow lines and these flow lines actually generate a, a series of islands. And this is actually uh, the main diagram for the whole project, which sort of followed it from the, the first uh, sketches uh, in the competition all the way through to uh, when it was executed on the building site. And what you see here is these series of islands, which we get then used to create uh, spaces where we could uh, make bicycle beds. The main function of this uh, plaza was to create an infrastructural plaza, for, which was uh, for bicycles, and that people easily could transit from bike to train and bus and so forth. And these uh, islands we then used to create these uh, bicycle parkings. So that uh, <clears throat> when you see this overview image of a airport, actually you see very clearly the, the diagram uh, showing both bicycle beds and also these uh, um, giant roofs, <laughs> concrete roofs that are floating, and also showing where you have public functions like accesses to uh, um, train stations and uh, covered uh, bicycle parking spots, and also where you have uh, toilets and shops. And if you uh, zoom in a little bit closer, you can also see this uh, structure of the roofs and the beds uh, together. So uh, <clears throat> what we wanted to do uh, with these roofs was to actually show where you have uh, ticket sales, where you have uh, public restrooms, um, but also where you have covered space where you can wait for your train or your bus and uh, transit in between. So you use these uh, concrete roofs to sort of mark uh, significant spots. Um, this is the main entrance to uh, the, the S train in our port. But what we also wanted to do is to have these roofs look, uh, look a little bit like they were pulled apart. They should be the negative of, uh, of uh, the bicycle beds. Um, at night, uh, it was uh, our idea, along with Battenbach, of course, to uh, create these, uh, the lighting that could sort of uh, underline these floating uh, majestic roofs that uh, sort of show 
where um, the access points to the train station are. So that when you come up from the train, this is what you meet. You will actually meet this uh, uh, concrete cloud floating, hovering above you, and actually uh, um, marking uh, both uh, your entrance to the city uh, and, um, <clears throat> and access to the trains. Um, what we also tried to, what we also thought was amazing uh, about working with this new geometry was that they sort of frame the city in a new way. That they um, that they give these completely new lines to the city. Here you can see somebody passing by on a bicycle uh, underneath one of the roofs. Um, these are basically all the design elements of uh, an airport. These are you see the public uh, the paving in between, sort of uh, giving functional flow lines. Um, and also the sunken bicycle beds and, uh, and the bicycle, uh, sorry, the roofs of Nurport. Also, we had to, to work with these uh, ventilation towers, which I will uh, get into a little bit uh, in a few slides, uh, which you see here, which are actually providing clean air to the train station underneath. So one of the, the main design features of uh, Nurport was actually just doing something rather simple is to sort of combine all the bicycle parkings in these beds and actually very simply just press it down and then to sort of organize the bicycle parking in a very rational manner. So that uh, when you uh, drop off your bike in the city uh, and you're in a hurry, you can easily uh, get an overview of uh, where the bicycle parking is and you can sort of see uh, where you have to go. Um, another really unique uh, design feature that we tried to work with here is that we designed our own bicycle stand. And uh, the importance of this was that uh, we could design a bicycle stand that um, not only sort of pushed the bicycles uh, tighter together so that we could have more bicycles closer to each other, but also on top of these there are small lighting elements which are designed to sort of um, absorb daylight during the day and then at night they transmit a small amount of light so that you can see where your bicycle is parked. Here you can sort of uh, see how the bicycles, they fit in together in this uh, system that uh, both uh, gives uh, lots of space to the bicycles, but at the same time is super compact. <clears throat> um, the station itself, it, it sort of reveals itself at, at uh, unique spots. Um, also these roofs that uh, you see in the historic streets of Copenhagen that they are sort of framed by the city blocks surrounding them. Um, one of the main uh, elements that we tried to work with uh, of Nurport was that we wanted to have a place that was open and transparent and that you very easily could get an overview of, in, uh, which was in contrast to the way it was before. But we also wanted to have the same uh, feature at night, that uh, the, the plaza and the space should remain open and uh, inviting, and that uh, the lighting should also give this uh, unique atmosphere. So that uh, these uh, ventilation uh, towers, they also light at night, the roofs are uh, hovering, and also the uh, bicycle beds are lit. So uh, when you see it at night, you see something like this. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a section showing how uh, the public place, uh, plaza is situated on top of the airport. And what, was, uh, what you see here is also uh, the importance of these uh, smokestacks. Unfortunately, not all the trains in Denmark run on electricity yet. Uh, we're a little bit behind there, unfortunately. And this means that these smokestacks, they have to uh, get clean air into the train station. But we wanted to make sure that they also become an inviting element so that they have this uh, sort of a reflective uh, glass on top of it that uh, give uh, sort of unique um, light effects during the day. But they actually also function as uh, benches so people can sit and, uh, and enjoy the public spaces. Like this uh, super cool guy uh, <laughs> enjoying the airport. Or uh, this girl who's uh, sitting and waiting for a train or bus and just enjoying uh, a ray of the daylight. So that's something that's uh, uh, actually a smokestack uh, chimney actually becomes uh, an extension of the public space. Um, right next to uh, Nørreport, we have uh, Isratsplads, which is uh, actually one of Copenhagen's uh, largest public plazas. <clears throat> you 
can see uh, actually you can see now what right here. And here you have the Israel's Press. Um, and historically, uh, sort of following the line of uh, this uh, topic of uh, from infrastructure to the public space, uh, Israel's Press used to be the, this magnificent uh, square where um, uh, you could buy things, uh, vegetables, clothes, food. It was a trade center in the center of the city. Um, as uh, Nyarkot, uh, um, sorry, as Israel's Press uh, sort of uh, changed over time, it became uh, more congested, more cars came into the city, the space was then sort of taken over by uh, car parking. <clears throat> but today it's uh, been given back uh, to the people. And to, uh, now there's an underground parking spot, and on top of this, you have this urban carpet, which uh, then is used for all of the city uh, of Copenhagen. And it's, uh, we call it a democratic space uh, in Danish, translated literally. But here you can see uh, a homeless guy sitting here drinking his beer, but you can also see uh, students uh, enjoying the sun on the folds uh, of this uh, plaza. Um, from above, you can basically uh, see that the, the plaza is this uh, very clear square uh, urban uh, carpet. And it's, it meets uh, Arsta's pattern here, and you can sort of see how it, the idea was to sort of slowly transition the, the park into the plaza. And then we puncture it with different uh, playgrounds, basketball fields, there's a skateboard park, and then we have these uh, giant folds which act as uh, urban tribunes where people can sit and uh, have uh, views onto the city. This is a, an exploded view of, a, of a how actually not, I'm sorry, Israel's, I keep saying Nauport, but Israel's Place works um, with the car park underneath, the, um, the urban carpet, and then these punctures on top with uh, the trees placed at last. Um, what's interesting about Israel's Place is it's also, it's not just a public space, but it's also a playground for the Sailor's School, which is right next to it. So uh, during the day, the school uses it as their playground. But also, um, um, this uh, basketball field is used for urban events to have, hold uh, not only informal basketball games, but actually also uh, urban uh, um, basketball uh, competitions. And the folds and the, uh, and the, in the landscape also make sure that people can sit there. And you have these small natural tribunes where you can sit and uh, watch uh, the basketball games being played. So um, you could say that the Israel's Place it, it changed from this market spot to this uh, new contemporary area in in, in, in Copenhagen city, um, which has been used um, for people to uh, um, drink beer, to uh, live everyday life, and just to enjoy the city. This is uh, some uh, folk dancers uh, uh, using Israel's Place before. And today, the kids uh, playing on some of the folds and the water elements. There's a small water fountain on the plaza, which uh, cuts through it. And, and what's really nice to see is actually these folds in the plaza. They don't just work during the summer when the sun is shining, but they also work um, in winter when it's snowing and when it's cold and not so nice to be there. That it's actually a, a plaza that you that's used all year round. Um, and it's used by everyone. It's also used for by skateboarders, BMXs, uh, um, uh, to uh, play with. It is this really urban element in the heart of the city. And what's uh, also nice to follow is that it's actually uh, used uh, really intensively. It, it has its own, uh, of course, its own Instagram page now. And uh, many people have used it, from uh, Tony Hawk, who visits uh, Copenhagen, he uses the skateboard park. Uh, to uh, somebody who's on uh, maternity leave, just going for a walk over the plaza. Um, <clears throat> the last uh, project under this theme I, I wanted to show is uh, um, Copenhagen University Park, um, which we call this landscape of uh, bike hills. And it's sort of uh, combining the knowledge that we gained working on uh, Nørreport and Israel's Place. Um, it's, a comp uh, it's a project we won in a competition and it's basically situated right, it's a space situated right next to Copenhagen University. And it was just this leftover space between some large buildings. And uh, what it was used for mainly was uh, bicycle parking. They were scattered all over the place. 
there were some benches everywhere you could uh, scattered all over the place where you could sit. Um, but it, it was just unused space. So um, our proposal uh, for this site was basically to, uh, to, again, to combine the bicycle parking, but this time to cover it uh, with roofs that are actually tribunes, that are hills that people can use to sit on and uh, actually sort of conceal the bicycle parking and give it this feeling of a continuous space. <clears throat> so what we wanted to do here, you have a, a, the plaza, and what we wanted to do is to make sure that the green space could sort of transition into the plaza and that you have these bicycle hills where you can park your bicycles underneath and that uh, also become these tribunes and hills where you can sit and enjoy the, um, the space and that students after their lectures or in between uh, meetings they can go out and eat their lunches and have breaks. Uh, this is a section uh, basically showing how these hills work. If you zoom in, it's, uh, you can sort of see the combination of elements uh, of the projects we've done before, and actually the potential of uh, covering these bicycle parkings and actually making these informal tribunes. Um, this is a visualization uh, looking from the green part of AMA and then onto this uh, new uh, public plaza. Um, the next theme that we uh, noticed uh, in uh, our urban living room was transformation as a resource. And, and it's this, uh, we are architects, so uh, we will also be showing some uh, building projects now. Um, uh, but it's this notion of uh, why do we tear down old buildings when we can reuse them in, instead. Um, this time uh, when we wanted a, a, a giant tree, we went out and, uh, and uh, tore it down. These days are over. Instead of, uh, of um, looking at everything as trash, we have to look at it as a resource. This is a, a gable in a, a, in a novel on Copenhagen that you meet while riding by every day, s uh, stating one man's trash is another man's treasure. And it's basically the mindset that we've been trying to uh, uh, use on some of our projects. Um, an example of this is uh, when uh, Copenhagen had to host the Eurovision contest. Uh, they used uh, an old uh, warehouse, an old derelict warehouse, and by the help of uh, designers, it was transformed from this uh, barren uh, structure to this amazing uh, venue that hosted the, the Eurovision Song Contest. So I would like to show you two projects where we try to uh, uh, use this, uh, uh, these ideas. The first is the silo. In, North, in the North Harbor of Copenhagen. And uh, basically uh, the silo uh, is an old uh, grain silo which was used for the storage of the uh, grain corns uh, before it had to be uh, uh, shipped over to uh, ships. Um, we won uh, the international design competition for uh, the North Harbor in uh, Copenhagen in 2008. And one of the things that we noticed while uh, working in the North Harbor were these magnificent um, silo structures. Uh, and actually, uh, as part of our planning process, we had to uh, convince the owner of the, the site, the Copenhagen City Port Authority, to keep these silos because they were slated for demolition and they saw no value in them. Um, but what we found when we were working on them was actually when you step into these uh, silos that they have this magnificent spaces, this, these concrete structures uh, which have uh, uh, eight meter high uh, spaces which you would not build today and uh, why would you tear this down instead of reusing it and actually implementing it in, in a new uh, type of building. Um, when we uh, x-ray uh, the building actually we see these uh, immense uh, uh, silos uh, and also these uh, pre-given uh, spaces. And we actually use these floor heights to continue into the building to, uh, to make our, uh, to transform this building into a housing project. Because uh, what you see when you're on top of the silo is you have these amazing views onto the city. Just by puncturing a hole in the silo, you, uh, you can just imagine the type of apartment you could have here, looking onto the harbor front, uh, looking over the city. So uh, what we did uh, was basically, if you have this uh, uh, old uh, corn silo, 
is that we wanted to reprogram it first of all uh, by having a public function in the, in the base of the building, but we also wanted to have a public function in the top of the building to make sure that the, the building, when it meets the public space, that it interacts. But what we also wanted to make sure is that uh, mainly uh, in Copenhagen there aren't that many high buildings. Most of the buildings are five to six stories high. So what we wanted to do is to make sure that, um, that the view is accessible for everyone. In between, we would then fill with a uh, housing project, uh, housing projects. And basically, what we wanted to do was uh, dress up uh, this old building with a new dress, a new clothes, a new layer of skin that could uh, give it a new life. Um, and basically, what you can see here is uh, this new skin that's being uh, pulled up uh, like a dress uh, uh, onto the building. Uh, what we uh, basically wanted, uh, wanted to do is what we wanted to des design an uh, intelligent facade. And this means that the facade itself was uh, built up of uh, prefabricated elements that uh, could be assembled on a factory and they could sort of uh, both uh, make sure that there's enough daylight coming into the building, that there's balconies, but that there's also insulation and a, a new uh, uh, um, facade system covering the building, shielding it from rain and uh, weather. These are the guys that uh, make this possible. Uh, if I just go back, oh, sorry. If you, uh, you can see these uh, guys that were rappelling off the facade and uh, sort of the crane was hoisting them up and they were uh, basically assembling uh, these elements from a factory. So uh, this old uh, derelict building, building slated for uh, demolition uh, looks like this uh, when it's uh, been transformed. So when you go from this old, uh, rough, uh, concrete structure, uh, that it now looks like this when you are in the North Harbor. Uh, and what's uh, amazing about this uh, galvanized steel facade and these uh, integration of balconies and the design of the folds in the facade is that they also uh, change over the time of the day, that the, the light is reflected differently, and, and uh, when the sun is setting, the building changes color, uh, it becomes, it, it's all the time changing, this uh, amazing uh, facade, so that when the sun is setting, it becomes uh, even darker and uh, uh, more pronounced with these balconies. Um, at night, you can see this uh, new uh, glowing uh, public restaurant that's situated on top of the, the tower. These are just, uh, I will flip through these, but these are just some floor plans uh, showing how um, the, the spaces can be used uh, and the, uh, the facade system is jumping as you go up. The idea is that these are um, um, uh, sorry, these are um, um, apartments that are sort of uniquely designed for uh, each individual user. So uh, that the, the people when they bought these apartments, they had the, the option to buy different modules and different apartments with different sizes, with double high spaces. Um, some spaces that are eight meters high, some spaces that are high, five meters high. What was uh, super important for us when we uh, transformed this building is that uh, the building itself, from the inside, still remained this uh, corn silo that you could still feel this concrete structure, <clears throat> and that the design itself of, uh, of the kitchens and uh, of the things that we put into the building, they would be in contrast to, to this uh, amazing uh, concrete building so that you have uh, these amazing uh, light conditions and easy access to uh, many different balconies inside the apartment. This is, of course, uh, before it's furnished and before it's uh, handed over to, uh, to uh, somebody who bought it, but you can just amaze, uh, you can see the amazing potential of the space. Um, also, uh, in the apartments, uh, we tried to, many places to keep the, the concrete floors to make sure that it really had this um, cathedral-like spaces uh, in these new apartments. And from the, the facade you could get these uh, amazing views onto the city. Um, the facade uh, with the balconies. And uh, in the ground level, what we wanted to do was make sure that it still stayed uh, an, um, uh, an event space. This is a space that can be used for um, uh, galleries, and it can be used, right now it's uh, used for an exhibition about the North Harbor sort of showing the development of the city. Um, so that uh, from the outside, uh, in, 
ground level, you can easily uh, um, get into this uh, new exhibition space. Uh, on top of the, the tower, uh, we have this new uh, restaurant, which is at the time, this is an early sketch of it, but it's going to be have these uh, 360 panoramic views onto the city, and will be accessible by everyone. And this is a really a, a unique tale for us uh, about saving the silo from a demolition, and it's of course uh, it's been done in strong dialogue with a, a, a visionary um, project developer to make sure that this building didn't uh, get torn down and that actually it can be reused for a, a new housing project. So that uh, something that was actually uh, sort of considered trash became one of the most valuable uh, real estate uh, projects in the city of Copenhagen. <clears throat> the next project uh, I want to show is uh, the Danish Rock Museum. And it's uh, situated uh, in, the, uh, in a city called Roskilde. Uh, many of you might have heard of it because of the Roskilde Festival. And, uh, but Roskilde is more than a festival, it's also one of the historic cities of Copenhagen, uh, sorry, of Denmark. It's, uh, it's situated on the outskirts of Copenhagen, and what you see here towards the north is the Roskilde Fjord, where the Vikings a thousand years ago used to sail in with uh, all the things they uh, gathered from their uh, trips, and they used to uh, lay their ships to anchor in here. Here you see uh, one of the cathedrals uh, of uh, main cathedrals of uh, Denmark, where all the kings and queens of Denmark are buried. And actually, here to the south, uh, you see uh, the Roskilde Festival actually in action, and it's it's a quite interesting image uh, showing this uh, juxtaposition of new and old uh, Denmark, uh, where actually Roskilde is transformed once a year to the fourth largest city in, the, in Denmark because of this festival. And situated in between these two uh, um, um, historic uh, and uh, contemporary elements is the uh, Rock Museum. Uh, the Rock M Museum is actually situated on a, an old uh, concrete factory. Uh, and it's uh, a concrete factory which was uh, bought by the city of uh, Roskilde. And they had this uh, aim and vision to uh, sort of uh, transform it into this creative uh, new district uh, with, uh, with a lively neighborhood of uh, apartments and, uh, uh, and, um, and to do this, what they wanted to actually to do was to have a catalyst which could sort of help transform uh, this area. And they made a competition for the, the new Danish Rock Museum. When we, uh, these are images from uh, when we had our first site visit, visit during the competition and we were amazed by this new industrial heritage that we were met with. And we just uh, thought this is something that we can't demolish, it's something that we have to build within, it's something we have to keep. Also what we noticed is actually these halls, uh, they actually had a function. They were used for art events, uh, they were used by skateboarders who uh, had uh, built half pipes and uh, skateboard parks inside. They were used for giant music events and also to uh, just as uh, workshop areas, as maker spaces. So we uh, we set up a series of design guidelines to help uh, enforce uh, that these um, these halls could be built. And what we wanted to do is to have a, a crowning element at the center of this, uh, the Danish Rock Museum. Um, here you see a before image and an after image of the Rock Museum. And the idea was, uh, very simply, is that we wanted to have a museum that clicks into the context, that actually fits into this, uh, these warehouses, and, and actually can uh, sort of be part of a new um, uh, complex of a, of a museum. So uh, when it was uh, just built, it looked like this. What we wanted to do uh, when we were designing this museum is actually to, uh, to uh, make something that is uh, playing off of the theme of rock and roll. Uh, it's not every day you get to uh, work on a rock museum. So we tried to uh, think of the rock iconography and the materials that are used, like leather jackets, uh, these uh, metal bracelets, and also these uh, uh, punk uh, belts that you have with the spikes. Um, and it was sort of the same idea that we wanted to implement in the museum, that it becomes a contrasting element, 
that uh, that you have these old worn down holes and this new uh, litter box that's uh, placed in between uh, the holes. The museum entrance is basically at the uh, end of a red carpet, which is a public space that takes you down from uh, one of the main streets of the area. And up here you see a floating museum box. And the idea of this uh, floating museum box is not only to make this uh, uh, magnificent gesture of uh, having a new icon in this new uh, district, but it's also to make a covered public space that can be used for uh, new events. And uh, here you see the red carpet, the, the red public space that meets the building, that uh, punctures the building and becomes this red foyer space inside the building. Um, and it's this uh, magnificent uh, glitter box uh, that changes uh, over t uh, uh, time, over the day, in the course of the day as uh, the sun changes. But uh, what we also did was actually we reused part of the halls to become this foyer space in uh, the museum so that the, the old halls, they become uh, the new uh, cafe, the new restaurant, and it becomes uh, an extension of the museum. <coughs> so that uh, the museum is, has this uh, red and the golden prisms that uh, um, attract people. And inside you have this red foyer space. Uh, just like when you uh, open a, a guitar flight case, that you have these uh, red prisms, this is what we wanted to achieve, to have this uh, really uh, unique red space that's uh, what the first thing that you meet as you enter the museum, but also continues outwards into the red carpet, the red public space in the build, uh, outside of the building. And, and what's unique about this space is that it's multifunctional, it can be used for concerts, uh, it can be used for um, different events. Um, uh, these are some uh, old guys uh, visiting uh, the museum. Maybe they went to the, one of the first Roskilde festivals, now they're thinking about old, uh, the old times. But what we really wanted to do is to make sure that we have these uh, um, contrasting elements of uh, rough uh, interiors, uh, copper uh, fixtures, and these uh, red prisms that they underline this uh, rock uh, museum. And our aim has been to make sure that this uh, museum, it sort of inscribes itself in this uh, the rich cultural history of the Roskilde, of the Viking ship, the Viking ship museum, and also the uh, um, the cathedral where all the kings and queens are buried, and also the uh, iconography of uh, the Roskilde festival itself. Um, the next theme that we uh, sort of discovered as we worked on uh, uh, our urban living room is uh, culture as a social engine. And it's uh, sort of this idea of uh, using um, public buildings to uh, reduce um, seg social segregation, that actually uh, um, cultural buildings, libraries, um, uh, are used actually uh, actively to uh, bring people together in the city. This is uh, basically uh, how we uh, sort of think of libraries, these amazing spaces where uh, books are stored forever, and, uh, and uh, have like, these uh, amazing uh, spaces, they're quiet, and you sit and read alone. But actually what you see today is um, that uh, books are being thrown out, books are becoming digital, um, the, the, the digital presence is uh, much uh, more important for libraries. Uh, and also that, um, that these uh, spaces are used more for uh, media, uh, uh, magazines, newspapers, and so forth, which ha have a much shorter lifetime. So if you could sort of say that the, the, be the beginning of uh, libraries was to sort of just cater to books, uh, then the notion uh, was to sort of maybe have public spaces in libraries, and what we actually saw was actually there's a much uh, larger um, usage of libraries now. Public functions are being put, put into libraries. This is where you can get your passport made, uh, this is where you can uh, also receive tax papers, you can have uh, maker spaces, um, you can also have uh, cultural activities at night, this is where um, courses are made uh, for adults. And so, looking at a map of uh, Copenhagen, what we saw is that actually some of the most problematic areas in Copenhagen, the city uh, has actually been putting um, uh, these cultural buildings, these libraries, to actually inv invigorate the areas and actually to sort of reduce social segregation. 
And uh, one of these uh, examples is, uh, that I would like to show is uh, the library in, uh, in uh, the northwest of Copenhagen. It's actually also this golden box, which is uh, placed in this uh, square of, uh, uh, of old uh, industry in the northwest of uh, Copenhagen, which is actually a very rough and uh, diverse neighborhood. It's a neighborhood with, where hundreds of different of nationalities are living, and it's also where there's lots of uh, social challenges for the municipality. <laughs> so what we wanted to do is actually to create a series of uh, stack books. And the idea is that, uh, or the metaphor you could say is that these books, like when you read a book, it's a world in itself, <laughs> and you step into a new space, and these spaces should be curated to, uh, to uh, highlight these worlds. Uh, the building is uh, put uh, next to an existing building, and actually by covering it, we create this uh, covered public space, a new uh, public street um, in between the old building and the new extension. So uh, <clears throat> the building is actually, uh, when you see it from outside, it's this series of stacked boxes um, with uh, four different worlds inside of it and a, a public space outside in front, attracting people inside. Here you can see a, a sort of a facade a image of the building which gives us this clear stacking of boxes. And actually what we wanted to do is to make sure that in between each box you have these sort of um, uh, open spaces which also can be used uh, for library functions. But when you step into the boxes, each box is sort of catered to a different uh, um, uh, group. You have uh, this box uh, on the ground level, which is the kids' library, which is like a three-dimensional Lego world, where kids can climb all over to, uh, the, um, the the book storages and they can uh, look for books. Uh, the second box is actually a youth library, where kids can come and do their homework. Um, and the third box is actually um, an adult library, where adults can sit and read books in peace and quiet. And the top box is actually an event hall where concerts and uh, dance events can be held. So in between uh, this new extension of the library and the old uh, cultural building, you actually have this new street that uh, unfolds and uh, you are sort of drawn and pulled into the building and you have this uh, amazing new covered street where you can not only go to the library to get a book or to turn in a book, but you can also go to a cafe and uh, read newspapers, you can uh, go into the maker spaces of uh, the existing uh, uh, library. Um, so uh, when you uh, are walking on this main street and you can step into one of the boxes and this uh, new world unfolds itself. <coughs> or the, uh, the youth library where kids are sitting and doing their homework after school. And of course uh, the adult library where you can sit and read uh, your thriller or uh, um, whatever a new uh, book uh, alone in private, privacy. And on top, uh, the event space is used for uh, uh, dance events, uh, for concerts and so forth. Um, and the, the, uh, you could say the aim of the building is to sort of uh, reduce the social segregation that people meet in this uh, building uh, in between uh, different uh, uh, cultures and also uh, different ages that they all meet, uh, that the building acts as a, as a sort of this social catalyst, a social engine. One of the most important elements uh, that we, uh, uh, or one of the most important things that we have to work with when uh, the cities grow is that we, we have to design for kids. Uh, and uh, designing for kids is a, a very unique opportunity because kids, in, in, in fact, they have no voice. And uh, Kobo, we've actually uh, worked on a series of, uh, um, uh, of uh, integrated institutions, daycares, crashes. What you can see here is a, basically a graph showing how uh, um, uh, the population of kids is growing. When the, if you want to make a livable city, you also have to make sure that there's also enough institutions for the kids so that the parents can go to work. Um, that uh, it's been a very much an integrated part of the Danish culture, these, uh, these um, uh, crashes and daycare centers, uh, to make sure that the, um, the um, welfare system and the welfare state can work. 
here you can sort of see the, the development of uh, different daycares over time, how it, it was very formal to begin with, with uh, their own seatings. And over time, in the 70s, it became more and more informal to today, where kids and parents uh, and adults and uh, Pedagoga, they're actually sitting on, uh, on the ground with the kids so that everything is in, in eye level. And what, we, what you see is actually that the, uh, the uh, existing uh, um, daycare system uh, of uh, Copenhagen was actually made sort of haphazardly, these old uh, barracks, which were put up very quickly to sort of cater for a, a quick need in uh, daycare systems. But what we thought was really important, it, it, we have this diagram which we like to follow and like to remember, is that the uh, half of a, a kid's uh, every day is spent sleeping, and basically only 20% is spent at home, and uh, around 30% of uh, a Danish kid's time is spent in a daycare system. And this means that uh, we have, a, as designers, a unique responsibility to make sure that these uh, daycare system, uh, these daycare institutions are designed properly. So I'd like to show you this kindergarten on Flexbat. Um, which is basically a little village that we designed. Uh, and it's uh, basically this idea of scaling a project down into a series of houses. Um, you could say that the, one of the uh, main uh, uh, guidelines for this project has been a sketch that we received from a kid showing how a daycare should be uh, drawn. And basically it's a, a series of small buildings gathered uh, you could say that the old kindergartens uh, of Copenhagen, they had uh, roughly 36 kids. But to uh, take care of this growing need of uh, um, uh, daycare, uh, the city of Copenhagen has actually been forced to make daycare that are uh, two, having roughly 200 kids, and they become sort of these uh, factories. And what we wanted to do is to make sure that these uh, buildings are broken down into a smaller scale, so that the kids, they actually can feel that they, the building is designed to their scale, not to an adult scale. So that it becomes this uh, series of uh, houses put together. And the idea for the building was that, uh, that uh, when we designed for kids, is that we, we wanted to design it almost like these babushka dolls. That it's uh, a house within a house within a house. So you could sort of say that in uh, some of the common spaces you have these small houses, where kids can uh, go out and get an overview. Here you can see uh, some of the kids uh, stepping out and getting a, a and sit playing with each other and getting an overview. But also the playrooms have these small mini houses. This is uh, the kids' toilet, which is a small house within the house. Um, so that uh, the the spaces actually sort of are scaled down to the size of the children. These are actually. Uh, even smaller houses which are used for uh, the kids to sleep in. Um, this is uh, the co uh, communal space in the center of the building. And actually this is uh, one of uh, the um, outdoor spaces uh, of the building where the kids can quickly access from the outside uh, or inside and get outside of the building. So it's also a covered space. Um, what we uh, thought was amazing about this design is that it was reviewed by uh, uh, the New York Post and uh, basically uh, they wrote that this architectural wonder is being wasted on five-year-olds. And we felt then that we had really achieved our goal as designers because we managed to design something that is unique for kids. Um, uh, the next uh, theme that I wanted to talk to, to you about is architectural democracy. Uh, and it's sort of working on this idea of uh, designing as a collective effort, that if, what happens if we design together. What you see in uh, uh, many uh, uh, of the famous uh, architects like Frank Gehry or um, Saadid is they talk about uh, these ideas of how they design, how they do things. Um, I, I don't understand why people uh, have hire architects and tell them what to do, is uh, what Frank Gehry says. Uh, uh, I pick up my pen, it flows, a building appears, um, Oscar Niemeyer said. But uh, what's uh, maybe more profound for us is a, a quote by Churchill, who said that we shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us. To, uh, to uh, um, sort of show this, uh, I wanted to 
give a little insight on the planning process of uh, on how uh, planning is working in uh, Copenhagen. That even in a big city like Copenhagen, it's broken down into uh, districts, so that each district has a local uh, authority. And uh, for example, when a, a, a project developer he uh, has an idea for a project, he will go to the city council and he will say, "I, I want to build a project." And they will sort of describe the parameters of this project, and then he will do, have a project design. But what's important is that this project is then, as part of the local planning uh, process, is then is given into sort of a public hearing. Uh, and this public hearing means that actually the project has to sort of cater to the local needs and wishes, so heights are met and, uh, and density is also adjusted. So Quiet Plus is actually a project that we uh, designed in this manner. And it's in the historic part of Copenhagen, uh, situated on the harbor front. Um, uh, for the past, I think, 10, 15 years, uh, many projects have been made for this uh, site. Um, uh, actually, one of the, the most amazing projects was uh, that we were really, really fond of is Erik van Egerhardt's uh, project, uh, which he won in a competition, uh, which was slated because it was too high. It, it sort of obstructed the views to um, uh, the existing uh, um, historic towers of Copenhagen. Uh, it was too high, it was too dense, it was too bold. But since then, many different projects have been designed for this. Uh, but none of them were sort of accepted by the local population. So uh, we were hired uh, um, to uh, look into the site. And what we did was to try and read the context. If you see here, this is uh, all the historic uh, warehouses of Copenhagen. And what we wanted to do uh, is to make a new extension that follows this uh, structure of the warehouses in Copenhagen. The next thing that we wanted to do is to sort of make sure that this project sort of for, uh, also makes a new streetscape on the backside uh, of, uh, of the, the harbor front on Strangel. And so along with this uh, local population, we had many different uh, um, public meetings and we designed this building that sort of clicks into the context so that uh, it becomes this new warehouse building that uh, um, has a contemporary feel to it, but also is adjusted to the height lines of, uh, and also the sight lines of Copenhagen. So you can say that we have these three uh, blocks. They, are, they were then molded and sort of adjusted to sort of fit to these different height lines and view lines. <clears throat> and then we worked with uh, adding a new public plazas on the back side of the building, but also to make a new uh, promenade, a new harbor front on the front side of the building facing the water side, but then also to work with the programming of the building to make sure that on the ground level that you have these new public functions that sort of enhance and actually activate these new public spaces that we want to generate. So that uh, when the buildings are placed and they're juxtaposed by these uh, um, <coughs> uh, warehouses, that you have this new uh, warehouse structure with colonnades and uh, and. Uh, <coughs> and a new harbor front, a new uh, promenade. And uh, this promenade is then sort of is used actively on a daily basis by people. I'm going too fast. Um, but the folds of the building are respecting the sight lines and making sure that all these historic buildings are in view from all these prominent sight lines. But the facades, uh, what we also tried to do is to make sure that when we uh, looked into the existing warehouses, that the ground levels, they relate to the, to the old warehouses, and the facades are sort of uh, a contemporary rereading of uh, these uh, systems. So that uh, when you visit the space, you actually feel like this is a, a new type of warehouse in the center of Copenhagen, or when you uh, cross the new pedestrian bridge uh, in the harbor front or when you're walking on the backside of the Strangel. What we also wanted to do is to make sure that these, uh, that the buildings, they had a new, uh, they had to use a, a classic material, uh, bricks, but they were used in a contemporary fashion so that they uh, actually give a new uh, rereading of a historic material. In between the buildings, you have these uh, public ac ac accessible areas that you can walk in between and uh, 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 use uh, the harbor front. The gables, uh, they, uh, uh, they click into the context and they give this new rereading of the, of the building, 
sorry, the context. But also they generate these magnificent spaces inside the apartments, that the apartments themselves actually uh, uh, benefit from these uh, adjustments of geometry. I don't know how I'm with time, but uh, this is the very last project I will show, and then I will let you guys go. But the, the last th thing we wanted to talk about is Copenhagen tomorrow, and is uh, this idea of sort of uh, um, uh, uh, how Copenhagen can grow without growing in size. This is a map showing all the industrial areas, old industrial areas of Copenhagen. And you can say that the North Harbor right now is being rebuilt to, uh, to uh, a new district, and we're working on that. But uh, the next uh, project I wanted to show, or the last project, is the Paper Island. And the Paper Island is actually this uh, magnificent area in the heart of the Copenhagen, and it's been closed off for the past 300 years. Because first it was a maritime base for the uh, Danish Navy, and then after that it was um, a paper storage for um, a newspaper press. And today it's been transformed to this new uh, um, uh, um, active uh, uh, creative area because uh, before it was used for paper storage in all these giant halls, warehouses, they were basically just used uh, for storing the newspaper rolls and uh, we helped to transform it into this uh, temporary usage of a, um, uh, uh, of a new harbor front, a new uh, spot in the city center so that you could say that this uh, old storage of a um, uh, of a, a newspaper to, became this uh, new, uh, lively uh, street food uh, mecca. Or this old uh, warehouse, uh, which were, was uh, completely abandoned, became our new office. And these uh, structures are magnificent. They have uh, unique, uh, amazing qualities, and they're basically, for the past four years, they've been reused uh, for temporary uh, events. But uh, all things must come to an end, unfortunately, and uh, when we moved there, uh, we knew it was only for four years and there would be an international competition, which we uh, took part in, and we were so uh, lucky as to win it. Um, and basically what we wanted to do is to keep everything that was there, but we had to demolish it, and we had to redevelop it, and this presented a, a really <coughs> difficult challenge for us, because what we wanted to do, as you see in this hand drawing, is to continue this life of the ground level in a new uh, building project. So what we wanted to do was actually to rebuild the halls in a new form and to make sure that these halls actually can be used uh, again for these temporary and also non-temporary events uh, for a swimming hall, uh, for, um, <clears throat> for um, fashion events, for the Copenhagen Fashion Week that some of the uh, old uh, beam structures actually could be used in the, the new halls. And basically what we did was to create a series of five halls that actually could uh, be reused, and there's a swimming hall uh, uh, in the corner, and then on top of that, that you have a, a new development in the heart of the city. So that uh, this uh, new development also could uh, meet the waterfront and have this uh, uh, southwestern facing uh, um, um, uh, harbor edge. And in the center of the project you would then have this uh, green heart, this hidden heart that can be used by all of the public. And uh, basically uh, working with this completely open uh, ground level, we could then actually add a new development on top and sort of continue uh, uh, having this amazing uh, housing uh, project and an amazing uh, ground floor level but also having a green development. And what we try to do here is also to work with the rereading of the context, that you have the halls, we wanted to put some new warehouses on top and to give them a new uh, geometric and uh, contemporary adjustment so that it could look like this when it's built. Thank you for your patience.